Hi everyone, big welcome back to the G to Z online event series. Thank you for joining us. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and the community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. My name is Nell Thompson. I'm the coordinator of the National Getting to Zero program, or as we refer to it, G2Z. I'll be hosting the webinar for you today, but um, I'm not to blame for any glitches on Zoom or uh, problems with the internet gods. So Getting to Zero was developed by the Animal Welfare League of Queensland, and they continue to support it to this day. G2Z offers its consulting support and educational services at no charge to local governments and not-for-profits across Australia. Our focus continues to be on companion animal welfare and management issues, such as strategy, legislation, operations, programs, and community engagement, working towards reducing intake to pounds and shelters and keeping pets in their homes. We invite people to take a look at our website at www.g2z.org.au Sign up for our regular e-news, connect with us via social media and to get in touch with us to see if we can help or just to have a chat about the issues that you're facing in your community or organisation. And so to today's session. Once I hand over to our presenter, there'll be around 50 minutes of presentation and around 10 minutes of question time once the presentation's concluded. The recording of this webinar will be accessible via our website for everyone to watch at any time. We're going to ask that everyone mutes themselves during the presentation unless our presenter indicates otherwise. If you have questions, you can start putting them in the Q&A section and we'll get through as many as we can at the end of the session. If you have very quick questions that relate to your understanding of the content, put your hand up and we'll try to get to them during the presentation. As always, please excuse any working from home background noises that might filter through. And if you'd like to pop your um, introduction details, your name, where you're from in the chat, we love to see where everyone's coming in from. So um, please do that. We're very excited to have Dr. Jessica Moore-Jones from Unleash Consulting and Coaching here today. Jess has been Executive Manager, CEO and Senior Advisor to Shelters Large and Small, Local and International, Government and Charitable. She's worked with more than a dozen shelters to assist with culture, structure, strategy and operational delivery, as well as some niche passions such as human behaviour for animal welfare and professional resilience. A Murdoch graduate veterinarian with further qualifications in business conservation and human behaviour, Dr Jess is committed to making her impact on animal welfare by focusing on the human element of the industry, on how we can use our most valuable resource, our people, to bring about change, whether that's within our organisation or in our communities. So over to you, Jess. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Nell. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, I know I was really excited looking through those chats for how many people are here from all different parts of the world. So absolutely wonderful. I'm sure that makes it some fairly awkward times of day for a lot of people, which is really great to see um, that people are so passionate about this topic that they're willing to be here. Now, the first slide that I'm going to put up is basically going to um, trick you because we lured you here with a topic called not dreading the strategic plan. And the first thing I'm probably going to tell you is the strategic planning is quite hard to get right. Um, and that I, you know, have a huge belief that strategic planning is actually the wrong term, that we shouldn't be using it. Yep, absolutely. Making a plan for what we're going to achieve is a vital part of what we do. But if we want our strategic plans to succeed, we need to start talking longer term and more about strategic management. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, but so I just wanted to sort of upfront let you know the strategic planning is only a small part of making sure that your strategic plan succeeds. And that's actually majorly what I'm going to focus on today. So you can get lots of info all over the internet from lots of different places on how to run a workshop and how to, you know, get your board engaged in your kind of planning day and that sort of stuff. Um, but what I think not enough people and places are talking about is how to make that actually succeed after that day. 
So today's sort of focus is actually going to touch a little bit on the day and what you should focus on, but most of it is actually going to be about the before and the after. So uh, why we're not going to call it a strategic plan, we're calling it strategic management. Who am I? Um, so you heard most of it from Nell. Um, I run a, a consulting which effectively tries to help shelters with these sorts of things. <laughs> um, so trying to improve animal welfare as a whole by helping us become better at planning for what we actually need to do for the animals and by helping um, get the people part of it right. So particularly when it comes to our staff, our new leaders, um, engagement, culture, obviously compassion fatigue in our industry is nobody here will be surprised to hear that that's um, rampant. So that's the sorts of things I focus on. And so strategy for me is absolutely the beginning of all of that. And this is where it should start. This is where it should end. This is where it should always, always, always come back to. And all of those other pieces, whether it's about our staff engagement, our community engagement, our actual going out and doing the things that we're doing to get the outcomes should really all come back, start and finish with what's our strategy. So you might've read in the, in the blurb for the session that a huge proportion of strategic change initiatives fail, okay? And even more interestingly, that's been the case since about the 1970s. That number hasn't changed since we started making measurements of these sorts of things. So I find that really interesting that as our methods of leadership, the sort of um, twos and fro's of management styles being in fashion and sort of the vogues of different ways of doing strategies, it hasn't actually changed the fact that since the 70s, between 60 to 80 percent of strategic changes fail. And as I'm sure most of you are aware, the actual sitting in a room having a day where we plan the strategy yeah sure there's sometimes some conflict but largely you kind of finish the day either feeling like oh that was a bit unproductive or yeah this is good i'm really excited about this it's the three months down the line that hurts a bit doesn't it it's the, you know, we were so excited about a strategic plan and we told our staff about it and we made little signs and we stuck them on the walls and, you know, we posted on our kind of internal Facebook groups or whatever it is that we have. And now everybody's just kind of doing what they always did. Oh, okay. So I guess I'll have to refresh the strategic plan and we'll have to stick them on the wall again and we'll have to talk about it again. And then six months after that, you're kind of, you know, nine months into your 18 month plan and going, oh, we're still doing things how we always did things. Because the issue isn't in the room where you make the plan. The issue is when you walk outside of the room. All right. A lot of you might have heard the model, um, a lot of people talk about the golden triangle of change communication, which is about communication, training, resources, and that if you fall down, um, that those are the three things that you've fall down and fallen down in. Um, a lot of people, you know, there's been a lot of research on what makes strategic changes successful. And they've very firmly shown that falling down in any of those areas will help you fail okay it's not just about doing one of them really well it's not just being exceptional communicator or chucking lots of money and time at it or putting your staff through six days of training we have to do all of those things well there is no one magic bullet um, but even more than that and as i'm sure you'll discover over the next 45 minutes or so um, there's a lot more to it i'm afraid so when all is said and done, a lot more gets said than done. Can anyone relate? Uh, particularly if you're kind of middle to upper management, um, but don't have the direct control over who makes these decisions and who does these plans. We spend a lot of time talking about the strategic plan. We tell our staff that the board and the CEO are going away for a weekend to prepare your strategic plan. We talk about the initiatives. We tell them about the targets that we set. And then we don't do it. <laughs> okay. And what that creates 
is that next time you want to do a plan, next time you want to do a change, next time you try to convince them that you've got a great idea, guess what? They don't really believe you anymore. Um, particularly any staff that have been there for more than a few years and they've seen the cycles of strategic plans, they kind of know that a lot more got said than a lot more got done. And this is one of the major issues that we face is that we start from a basis of our staff not really trusting the process. And if our staff don't buy into it, it's never going to happen because at the end of the day, we can work as many hours and as hard as we want, but they have to deliver it. And so when it comes down to starting your process and you're, you're starting to think about strategic planning, maybe what we want, it is absolutely imperative that you suss out how your staff feel about this, because I would make a really strong estimate that a huge proportion of your teams will be rolling their eyes when you go, oh, yeah, we're going to put out a new strategic plan. Your newbies, your newbies will be fine. They'll be excited about it. But anybody who's been there for more than a few years, for more than one cycle of this, is just going to go, uh-huh, yeah, sure. So the board's going away. We're spending our organization's money buying them tea and coffee. And then they're going to talk about some what I call wank words, which I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say on here. Um, but, you know, words that are, you know, kind of just, make you sound like a bit of a douchebag. Um, we use these big words that sound fancy, but kind of just mean common sensey things. And they just roll their eyes at that and go, uh-huh, yeah, sure, management speak, whatever. And that is where we're going to start. So a lot of you might have seen something like a balanced scorecard before. Okay, generally these are created for for-profit businesses. Um, so they usually have people, policies, and something along the lines of finances, sales, um, you know, revenue, those sorts of things. And then maybe they chuck in a fourth quadrant, which might be about, you know, corporate social responsibility or something like that. I don't tend to work off that standard template because I believe that the charitable charity version of a balanced scorecard and the four things that we should be balancing in our organization when we think strategy or operations are a little bit different. So you're welcome to take as many screenshots as you like of this. Um, I'm sure Nell might be able to send you this PowerPoint afterwards. Um, but what I'm, the main reason I'm saying that is because this isn't what I'm going to be focusing on. These are things that you will want to cover off in your plan and, and which of these are the things that you need to focus on. But as I said at the beginning, this stuff you can find lots of places, all right? And so this is an important part, but this isn't where most plans fall down, okay? So grab some screenshots, take a photo, whatever you like, or we'll send this around afterwards. Um, all of these are, you know, this is one that I've created um, just because these are the things that I found to be vital when we, when we work with animal shelters, um, but, you know, they don't have to be set in stone. Instead, what we're going to be talking about is moving away from the strategic plan and into strategic manage management, okay? Away from the day of analyzing where we're going, data, numbers, that sort of stuff, into how do we actually make that happen, okay? So the very, very, very short version, because I have about 40 minutes left to impart something that often takes months, all right? So the very short version of how we're going to go about succeeding in our strat planning is before, okay, we have to actually do a bunch of work before we ever get to making the plan. Most of that work is around people, you, your board and or senior management, depending on where you sit in that scheme of things, and your team, okay? We need to make sure that ourselves and our board are sufficiently committed to this and that we have a chance of getting our staff to buy into it. And then there's the during, there's the actual planning, there is the, you know, taking numbers, taking data, thinking aspirations, where are we going from here, where do we want to be, do we want to make ourselves obsolete and those sorts of conversations that we have. And then we have all, all of these amazing ideas and things that we want to achieve and you need to cull. You need to cull willy-nilly, okay, because the more things you try to achieve, the less successful you will be at all of them. And then there's after we walk out of the room, okay, we walk out of the room with a piece of paper and what we're 
desperately trying to avoid is a situation in which that piece of paper gets stuck on a wall or sit on your bookshelf and never goes any further, okay? Everybody has the best intentions when they walk out of the room, but if it doesn't translate into different actions, it was a waste of two days of your life. Okay, so we're going to go through each of those steps in a little more detail, though, given, you know, 40 minutes, three steps, three steps within each step. So, we've, you know, we've got about four minutes per thing. So this is the most condensed webinar you'll have been to in a while. Um, and I will try very hard not to um, skim over it. But if you do have any questions about this stuff afterwards, feel free to chuck me an email. Feel free to give me a call. Um, I'm always happy to talk about any of this sort of stuff to anybody that needs help. So step one, before you go anywhere near your plan, before you set a date, before you check when the board's free, before you, you know, order catering, there's a lot to do. If you really want this to work, it doesn't start with the plan. Okay. The first one, this is confronting, this hurts people's feelings, and this makes people uncomfortable. And I'm sorry for starting off with this, but you need to start with you. Because at the end of the day, much as we might not like it to be true, if you are the CEO, it is your job to make sure this happens. Okay, come rain or shine, whatever happens, if it didn't work, you were accountable for that. Okay, I once was the CEO of an organization. <laughs> that um, had a cyclone sweep through. We lost our roof. Um, we were without power or water to feed our animals for three days. And we were due to have our biggest fundraiser of the year from a national federation perspective the week later. And everybody said to me, oh, you know, just cancel it, just cancel it, just cancel it. And I said, uh, nope, it's part of my strategic objectives. The cyclone was not, um, and I'm not going to be diverted off course. Now we had to adapt. We had to make changes to how we had intended it to run. Um, but nonetheless, it, it is important that you, as the leader, know how much hard work this is, allocate the right amount of time, and are actually genuinely committed, not just to the planning it, but to the doing it. Okay, I know that sounds really obvious because clearly you're already on this call, you're already really interested in this topic. But at the end of the day, um, this is often where things fall down, is you get busy and you have other things that you need to focus on. And that is where stuff starts to trickle. And then three, six, nine months later, this is just a piece of paper on the shelf, okay? The big question I tend to ask people before I offer to work with anybody on their strategic plans is do you even know why you want one, okay? Really common scenario is people kind of go, oh, yeah, well, we're due to review our strategic plan. Now, that's fine, okay? If you've got a strategic plan that goes from 2018 to 21 and it's due for a review, and all you want to do is kind of go, yeah, well, this is where we're at. We're kind of going to keep going in the same direction. You know, you can probably get away with that. That's fine. All right. But if your objective is to genuinely and authentically go where to from here, whether that's in a post-COVID economy, whether that's in a we want to start moving away from reactive and move towards proactive, whether that's in a, we want to grow, we're a small rescue and we want to actually be a big player in this game, whether that's a, um, we currently only do sheltering, we want to have community clinics, we want to change our revenue generation models to be away from pure fundraising towards sustainable business modeling. Um, if you have a change objective that is fairly substantial in terms of your direction, you need to understand why a strategic plan is the right thing for you. And if you can't articulate what it is that you need out of that plan, you probably want to rethink about whether you've got the right amount of time to commit to it. Okay. Otherwise, just review the old plan, check how you're going on your progress, keep going. All right because there's no point putting in all of this time and effort if you don't have a real genuine reason to move towards something, okay? The next floor, <laughs> okay, the next gap can be your board, okay? Or your board or your senior management, depending on what your structure is, who's involved in these sorts of things, okay? But the people that you're going to bring together 
and who have to take ownership and sponsorship of the success of this plan. Okay, the first question is, have they got the time to do this? And that means both the day itself and the after the day stuff, okay? Because you'll have a lot of people that joined your board going, yeah, I want to help cats and I'm really passionate about this, but I also have 17 other places that I help and two full-time jobs. And actually, you know, I, I just wanted to come along for one afternoon a month, you know, and that's fine. That's totally fine. There are will be a lot of people on your boards, particularly on your volunteer boards, that this isn't a feasible option for them. And you need to be honest and talk to them about that and talk to them about the roles that they can have and the roles that still work for the organization where they can add value. But that if, if this isn't something that they commit to, um, then they need to be prepared for not being a part of that process. Okay. I do mention at the bottom here that consensus decisions are the enemy of progress. Now, this is contentious. Not everybody agrees with me on this. OK, I'll have I'll have a lot of uh, detractors with that comment. Consensus decision making, particularly in the boardroom, allows one person to hold your strategy hostage. OK, consensus decisions are fantastic in an environment where it's appropriate. OK. This often isn't one of those, okay, because you are a group of people with different experiences, different expertise, and if you try to sit in a room and in one day, preferably two, you are in a position of having to get every single person to agree on every single thing that you decide, knowing that your board's probably going to change year by year, day by day anyway, you're going to find yourself stalled for a really long time, okay? Having said that, simple majorities are dangerous as well, okay, because then you're going to fail to get buy-in. So you really should aim to have a sort of really kind of majority vote that fulfills at least sort of two-thirds to three-quarters of, of the organisation is really pro whatever your decision-making is, okay? Now, this is hard and it requires commitment and it requires people to be... Um, have really constructive and sometimes difficult conversations when not everybody gets exactly what they want. Um, but that is a part of this process that, you know, myself or, or lots of other consultants in the space can help you with facilitating those discussions. And lastly, as I said before, most importantly is your team, okay? If they already distrust this process, you are starting from behind, okay? And you need to work on that before you come out with a plan because Otherwise, the moment the plan is created, it's set up to fail. All right. So how do we start improving their trust in the process? The first version, acknowledge that you haven't done it that well before. Don't lie. Suck it up. Step up and say, yeah, you're right. That last strap plan did just sit on the shelf for the last three years. OK. Here is what we're going to do differently to make sure that that doesn't happen again. The absolutely imperative first step to having any chance of buy-in for this new one is to acknowledge what didn't work with the old one and how you're going to do it differently this time, okay? There is no fudging it here. There is no politically correct speak about, you know, well, I'm sorry that your perception is, okay? If you didn't do it well enough last time, you just need to outright come out and say that. Don't be a politician. Be a leader. Own it. Yep, sorry, we didn't get that right, okay? But this time we're going to because here's the steps we're going to take that are going to be different, all right? You really do need to have what I call the burning platform, okay? You need to have a reason why change is necessary. Otherwise, people just kind of, you know, classic, well, if it's not fixed, don't, if it's not broke, don't fix it. People genuinely believe that. Well, they don't. But when they're stressed and when they're busy and when they've got a whole bunch of other things, there has to be a reason for them to want to buy into what changes you're proposing. OK, now, sometimes the burning platform is really easy and obvious. COVID was a really great burning platform, OK? Or we're about to go bankrupt is a really obvious one. Or, you know, those sorts of things. What are harder burning platforms are, this isn't sustainable. OK, if you start talking about sustainability, that kind of borderline fits into that management speak where they go, oh, well, 
we're doing it now, okay? It's not their job to forecast market changes and changes in demand of your services. That's your job. They don't understand that stuff. So if there isn't a really obvious burning platform, you have to find one. You have to create a sense of urgency. Why is it imperative that we change and that we change now? Okay, because if people don't believe there is a strong enough reason why they have to change, the change resistance is massive. Third point on your staff before you even get started is that this is the point where you start engaging them in this process. You should not walk into your strategic planning session with your board and senior executives without having had a planning session first with your staff. Okay, now the format of this, there's lots of different options that people can help you facilitate, but the short version of it is you need to understand what they believe to be the priorities. You need to, you know, get as many as you can, okay? You can do an ease versus impact chart. We'll talk very briefly about that shortly, okay? But the short version is you need to make sure that they know you walked into that room advocating for what they need. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of what they need is operational. So it won't make your strategic plan, okay? That comes back out at the other end when we talk about operationalizing your strategic plan. But they need to believe fully and genuinely that you've gone into that room advocating for the things that they need, okay? Otherwise, when you come out of that room, they don't care. Yeah, none of this is rocket science. It's just putting it all on a page, okay? Next, though, we get to the fun part. Now, this is the fun part. I really love running sessions where we help boards and, and senior execs come up with a strategy because it's so, you know, they, they walk into it so wide eyed. And, you know, it's, I love watching people's faces as we create this inspirational thing that they're so excited to start, chunk their teeth into. So this is what I call the fun part. Okay, now a lot of people will set aside one day for their board strap plan because their boards are all volunteers and it's really hard to get them together. If you can, if you can at all, I highly recommend two. Okay, the first day should be about exploring, putting together some drafts, putting together some ideas, walking out of the room, and then letting people stew over that overnight. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> which sounds dangerous, I know, but people mull things over and they come up with extensions of an idea and that once people have pitched something that's inspired them, they actually are able to take it a little bit further. So then the second day should be about, okay, well, what, what have we mulled over that? And then the second afternoon should, wherever possible, also bring your management team into the room. Okay, well, your senior execs should be in the room the first day, but I would always recommend wherever possible bringing your middle managers into the room for the second part of the second day where we can start talking about accountabilities, operationalizing that. Okay, so the whole point of this is to get aspirations, but a successful business plan should also be able to walk out with operational versions of that. All right. So the actual day, is it aspirational enough? This is one of my personal biggest passions. I work with a lot of organizations who have a strategy to do a bit better. Okay. You know, increase outcomes by 5% or, you know, de sex 500 animals this year. Okay. That's good. All of those things are good targets. I'm not saying that they're not good targets. I'm saying that if you really want to evolve as an organization, be that you're, you're a small one now and you want to become bigger, be that you're a big one now and you want to get rid of your shelter and start being the major player and preventing animals ending up at shelters, whatever your, your kind of goal is, it has to be big. These are big problems that we face, guys. Small solutions are not going to fix them. Okay. If your plan that you work out with at the end of day one doesn't make you a little bit nervous, it's probably not that good. You probably could have just reviewed your old one and kept going mainly how you are, but working a little bit harder for a few more hours every week with a few more staff on. Okay. If you really want 
to evolve, if that is the stage you're at and that is why you've joined this webinar, okay, you have to start with a vision that is big, that is bold, and that may even not really be achievable, but by God, we're going to aim for it, okay? So always do what I call reverse engineering. You want to start with, if you were to ask the question, 10 years from now, what are we achieving? And then you need to work backwards. Okay, so if that's where we want to be in 10 years, where would we need to be in five years? If that's what we need to be in five years, what do we need to achieve in the next two? Okay, if you do the opposite, if you start from a position of where are we now, where do, where do we want to move forward, you will get stuck in the barriers too. You will get stuck in, oh, currently our technology is average or currently our internet won't allow us to have better way of doing, you know, more mobile technology. Or currently we can't do that because our staff are really struggling. If you start with what's our priorities for the next two years, you firstly it won't be that aspirational, okay? But secondly, you will get bogged down in the why we can't, okay? Barriers will continue to come up and you will focus mainly on operational challenges. Again, I'm not saying operational challenges aren't important, but they're not what today is about, okay? We're going to start with 10 years. If you're a small rescue, five years might be okay. If you're a medium to large size rescue, you want to start with 10 years. If you're the big players in this space, if you are RSPCA, ASPCA, Humane Society on a national level, you should be starting with the 20 to 30 year goals. Okay. 20 to 30 years from now, what is our organization achieving in the world? And if that's what we want to be in 20 years, what do we need to be? Where do we need to be at at 10? What building blocks do we need to create in the next five years? Okay. You know, I've had conversations recently where we've talked about people, of, you know, okay, so we need a total, you know, overhaul of the site. The site is no longer suitable for the amount of animals that we intake. Okay. So if we were to say that in 10 years, we want a completely new shelter and that's going to be, you know, $8 million, if you continue to do your opera, your strategic plans like, oh, you know, well, in the next two years, there's no way we're going to come up with $8 million. So you just keep it off the list, don't you? It's just not on your list because you know you can't come up with that in the next two years. But if you put it in the 10 years, okay, well, that's where we need to be then. So then in five years, we need to have raised this much money or we need to have acquired this many bequesters for that specific project or we need to have done a capital campaign for xyz and so then in the next two years which is our immediate operational goals what systems do we need to get in place for our crms and our fundraising to be successful okay so it's not about um it's working from the reverse engineering perspective isn't about being just simply, you know, this kind of blue sky thinking. It actually makes you better at creating the immediate priorities because you know what you're working towards. Okay. I'm going to speed up because I'm running out of time because I always talk too much. I'm sorry. Um, I did just very quickly put the comment at the bottom that obsolescence should be the aim of a shelter, but not an organization. Okay, lots of shelters that I talk to talk about, oh, we want to make ourselves obsolete. And they kind of say it as a joke and they kind of mean it. Well, they definitely mean that they don't want to have to exist, but nobody really thinks they won't exist. If you're in this phase of your evolution where you think that the next phase for you should be to be obsolete, okay, you should be aiming to think about, I would like there to be so many desexed animals and such responsible pet ownership that shelters are not required, okay? You as an organization, though, then need to go, well, what's our role in making sure that those all those animals are desexed and all of those people are that responsible okay because sadly but honestly animal organizations and charities like ours are never not going to be required all right 
I would love, and I am totally with you, I would love in 30 years for there to be no need for animal shelters that have huge volumes of animals in our care just because they're stray and nobody wants them. All right. But that doesn't mean we are not going to be needed as a service. It might be because we just provide temporary accommodation for people who are going into hospital for a week or who are homeless. And, you know, we provide those kind of emergency boarding situations. But outside of that, it also might be that we're providing desexing programs. It might be that we're providing feeding homeless people's pets for them so that they can stay with their owners. Whatever that might look like, whatever is right for your organization will be completely different, but don't aim for obsolescence. If you are at the stage where you want to be obsolete, remember that your shelter might want to be obsolete, but you as an organization are still needed in the community. Cool? So next, the difference between strategy and operations, possibly one of the single biggest causes of conflict in these conversations, because the board is so keen to help you with your staff issues or your technology issues that they're forgetting to think about what their actual role is. Or conversely, you as the senior execs or the, the CEOs are sitting there going, you know, well, I want to fix, um, you know, the fact that our plumbing is terrible and forgetting that that is not your board's job. Okay. So we need to be really clear. If in doubt, please God, Google, okay? What should your board be doing and what should your operational teams be doing, okay? So if you walk out of the room with a strategic plan that is more than one page long, it's not a strategic plan. If you have a strategic plan that is full of wank words and that your staff can't, can't understand any of the words, it's very unlikely to be successful. OK, it needs to be clear, it needs to be concise and it needs to be this is where we're heading. OK, but and this is why I like two day sessions, because of the second day we want to talk about how we're going to make that happen. All right. And this is why I like to start bringing middle management into the room and start talking about this is our strategy. How do we operationalize that? How do we actually make that happen? Now, the third point on the actual day, because I don't, I do want to make sure we save time for after the day. The third point is to make sure that you only have, and this is hard, this is really, really hard, that you only have three to four initiatives on your plan at the end of the day. Okay. Because if you have five, six, seven, eight strategic initiatives, all of them, will be set up to fail okay if everything is important then nothing is important anymore how do people find time to prioritize more than three major things in their days weeks months years all right because they've got actual jobs on a day-to-day -day basis all right this is hard to do most organizations fail in this space in that they put a lot in their strat plan and it is impossible for anyone to pull off okay so what i would tend to do is blue sky it come up with all the things that you would like to achieve and then we do what i call an ease versus impact chart again if in doubt feel free to google an ease versus impact chart but it is effectively how easy is the thing to do how much outcome difference is that going to have for our organization okay now the things that are in the quadrant for high impact and easy to achieve guess what someone else can probably do them okay give them to one of your promising aspiring new leaders all right if it is easy to achieve and it's easy to pull off but it is going to make an impact that is what you have project managers for that is what you have aspiring people that are looking for a development opportunity for okay if it is obviously if it is not going to make that much impact and it's really hard no, we're probably not doing that. If it's not going to make that much impact, but it's really easy, maybe some volunteers. Okay. Get a project working group of volunteers to try to pull that off. And of course, the things that we are going to do, the things that 
only the senior executives can really pull downwards into an organization and fully embed other things that are pretty hard but a very high impact, okay? And if you've got 10 things up in that corner, you need to find the three or four that are in the toppest top corner. All right, it's hard, it really is. I, I understand this from personal experience, but I really strongly believe this, okay? Cool. And in, on that side, so it's not the obvious non-priorities that you need to fear. It's the almost top priorities. Okay, We don't tend to get distracted by fluff because we're good managers and good leaders and we know how much we care about the things we really want to achieve. The stuff that's obvious fluff, they don't, you know, I mean, sometimes we get a bit distracted because we want to and we need a brain break. Okay, but it's the almost top priorities. It's the ones that are somewhere in here in your quadrant. Those are the ones that distract us. Now, very, very quickly, again, screenshot if you want to, but this, you know, we can send this to you. This is just my version of what you should walk out at the end of the day. Vision, mission, four priorities, absolute maximum, totally understandable for by your staff and making sure that they were reverse engineered, not created based on your current operational issues. And then your targets to know that you will have achieved them. OK, anybody that went to, you know, any sort of goal setting course ever, you need to make sure they're smart goals. But you need to know this isn't the same as an execution plan. This is the what and the why. Nothing else. OK, and then, though, and again, grab your screenshots if you want to. This is a very basic template for what an ops plan should look like. So you should have your strategic priorities. OK, three, maybe four. What are the actual activities that are going to do to make that happen? Targets, deadlines, and very importantly, who's doing it? This is what I talk about as the second part of the second day. It doesn't actually have to be done on that day. You can do it later, but in my experience, it tends to drag out. And then thirdly, and don't forget this step, repeat this same template for your departments so that your middle managers know what they are responsible for. Lots of organizations think that they do this because they put it in that department manager's personal performance plan. Okay, but if it's only in the performance plan, which the rest of their team does not have visibility of, how are they ever supposed to start from a place of engaging their team? Okay, all right. But now the real work starts. You had the fun part, okay? This is where it gets hard. This is where they all fail, guys, all right? Do not forget that when you walk out of the room, you have only just started your work. So firstly, your people. Engage them over and over and over again. You need to give them your drafts. You need to get their feedback. You need to take their feedback seriously. You need to actually respond to their feedback in a meaningful and genuine way that is not brushing off their concerns, okay? Their concerns may remain operational, but you need to make sure you can show how your strategic plan is going to fix their operational issues, okay? It's not their job to think strategically, it is yours, but you need to make sure that you can link their issue with your strategy, okay? You do need to give them ownership and empowerment to get on and do that, but this is something that some managers may use as an excuse just to not be that engaged in their team, okay? Oh, I'm empowering them to make their own decisions. You need to make sure that they are appropriately trained, supported, and coached all the way through this, okay? Yes, empowerment is important, but you can't just say, here's our new plan, go away and do it, okay? You need to be that person who is underneath all of that, propping them up while they are empowering, okay? Your people does also include, have you got the right people? Sometimes your people were the right people for the last strategy, but they may not be the right people for the strategy. Firstly, because just basic skills and capabilities and what you require might actually be different now. But also on that more subtle level, if people can't change and you spend 80 percent of your time dealing with these really toxic change laggards, it's going to undermine your success, okay? Now, you're going to have a few of them, and that's okay if the bulk of the majority tips them over the line into the, the general peer pressure being supportive. But if you've got a team that needs changing, now's the time to do it, okay? I'm going to skip to the one at the end and come back to ruthless consistency. Just do it, okay? Find the time. 
do not allow yourself to go, oh, oh, that's okay. This thing's more urgent, okay? If you work on the 30, 30, 30 rule of how you should be spending your time as a senior leader, which is 30% of your time should be doing the daily do, 30% of your time should be with for your staff, okay? So either directly with them, helping them with their concerns, working on engagement strategies, and 30% of your time should be on making stuff better. In that 30%, Half should be those kind of immediate things that crop up to make stuff better and half should be this, which means that about 15% of your time must be dedicated to making your strat plan actually become a strategic management, okay? And that does mean even if you are a manager who likes to have an open door policy, you have to find the time to sit at your desk and make this stuff happen. And that's going to be a day a fortnight, half a day a week, whatever that looks like to you that works for your operations, where you close your door, where you put in your earphones and you're, if you're in open plan office or where you work from home for the day. OK, because if you don't put in the time, none of this would happen. OK, your managers must be held accountable for their parts of it. OK, I know we all like to be nice to our managers because they prop us up and they stop us from having to work even harder than we already do. But you have to be get good at having those conversations with them when they say, oh, no, I haven't done that thing because it's been really busy. OK, that's fine. Sometimes stuff does get really busy. What are you going to do next month to make sure that by the time we check in at our next monthly meeting, you are back on target? How are you going to avoid that thing backtracking you again? OK. The last one I like to talk about is In the Middle, okay? It is a really good book, um, Michael Koenig, which is about, it's literally called Ruthless Consistency, and I like it. It's very much about how if you want your plan to succeed, everything that in your organization has to come back to your plan. The words that you choose, the imagery that you use, the campaigns that you do, what you talk about in meetings, what you talk about in your intranet, Facebook groups, whatever it is that you have. I would recommend that at least three times a day, something you say links directly back to your strategy. Okay, if you want this to be lived and breathed, you and your managers must make that happen. And that is by making sure that it is totally unavoidable. OK, they can't not know what is in your strat plan. How many of you can say that all of your staff can tell you what's in your strategic plan right now? Not that many, right? OK, you must be able to make sure that even if they can't remember the exact wording, every single person in your customer service team and your animal care team know what is in your strat plan because you talk about it or mention it or use it in your imagery or do some public campaign about it three times a day minimum forever not just for the month after your meeting okay because these are 18 to 24 months plans right and then you make a new one which means it's still an 18 to 24 month plan which means forever your words matter you are in a fishbowl they are watching sorry they are judging it sucks the reality of a leader is really sucky they will judge everything you say, everything you do, and everything you don't say and do. So if you're talking about your strategy and how important it is to be customer focused, and then you come out from a customer interaction and you go, oh, I hate that person. Doesn't matter that you had 20 excellent customer interactions prior to that, that's the one they remember. Fishbowl sucks, but it's real, sorry you need to make sure you're using the magnifying powers of that fishbowl to make sure they see you continue to ruthlessly consistently bring everything back to our strategy cool all right lastly you know just talking about that time management okay a lot of people really like to go oh i like to be down with the team okay now if you're a really small rescue sometimes that is absolutely necessary for you to be down there helping them move cats about and whatnot okay but then who's leading the direction of the organization absolutely help you know grab stuff as you're going when things go really tits up and there's an emergency absolutely get stuck in chuck yourself in there but if you're not closing your door for that half a day a week or that day a fortnight they are going to start to wonder who knows what direction we're heading in 
what's ha what's happening? How are we how are we going to make sure this disaster doesn't happen again? How are we going to make sure this gets better all the time? Otherwise, it just feels like a constant, constant, constant slog. All right. It's really, really noble to be the sort of leader who is down there with your team. Fabulous. I highly recommend you for dedicating, you know, that 30, 30, 30 rule. 30% 30 of your time should be about your team and that fits in here. But it should never detract from the 30% of your time, which is about making stuff better. Yeah. Controversial. I know. I like to make people really uncomfortable. <laughs> but I promise I do know what I'm doing. I have done these things. They have succeeded. Okay. They do take organizations from being good to being excellent. Okay. So quick recap. Yes. I promise I'm almost, almost running on time today. <laughs> Okay, first up, check your commitment. You are the person who has to make this happen. If you are the CEO or a senior executive or chair or president, you are the person who has to make this happen. Is your board and your senior exec committed? Okay, do they know how much time commitment and resource commitment this requires, not just on the day, but going forward? And have you thought before you walk into the room about how your staff perceive this moment? Do they care or are they already actively distrusting of it? In which case you've got a lot of work to do before you ever book a session. During, make sure you know what strategy and what's operations. Make sure you are reverse engineering. Do not start with what do we want to achieve in the next two years. You'll get bogged down in operation and barriers. Start with where are we going to be in 10, 20 years, depending on the size of your organization, maybe a bit less. And then ruthlessly cull your priorities. You'll hate it. You'll hate this part so much, but it is important. If you want any of them to succeed, you can't have too many of them, guys. And then walk out of that meeting and you need to get your team's feedback. You need them to buy in. When you're doing updates on how's the strategic plan going, because you've just come out of your monthly managers meeting and you've gotten your you know, accountable kind of manager reports on their components, you actually try to get your staff to give that feedback. You want your staff to talk to other staff about how the strategy is going because then there's buy-in, all right? You want it to always make sure it's 10 to 20% of your workload is achieving this stuff no matter what happens, okay? Sure, if a cyclone comes through, you can probably take a week, but then the next week you need to put twice as much back in to make up for that, all right? And most importantly, I believe, is ruthless consistency. Keep doing it, keep talking it, keep saying it. If this becomes a poster that you've stuck on your wall and then nobody else knows about, you have already failed, okay? Everything you do, everything you say, every decision you make, not only should it come back to your strategy, you have to talk to people about why, how, and what that means. Cool. There are plenty of people out there that can help you facilitate these, help you make sure that they come true. All right, I won't take on a consulting client unless they are committed to working with me for at least 12, preferably 18 months, okay, because it's not about a two-day facilitation. And if you've got somebody out there that offers you a cheap price to facilitate your conversation for a day, cool. Only if you are exceptional at pulling it off afterwards. Okay. That is me. Um, this is how you can find me if you want to screenshot that. If you want to um, check me any questions, happy to answer them always. Um, otherwise, I will hand back over to Nell for some Q&A if anybody has any. Wow, you did really well <laughs> getting all that into that hour. <laughs> yeah, Fantastic anybody's brain job, exploding yeah. yet? <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone's just sitting there like, <laughs> that was brilliant. <laughs> You so can watch it again me. later and take it in slower. <laughs> Absolutely. And we had a question, um, or you talked about the um, the PowerPoint presentation, and we will link that with the uh, recording of this webinar on our website so that people can go through that separately and then uh, watch the recording again. And I think this will be a great session to have as a um perhaps a, a managers get together something like that you know so that everyone watches it together what do you think about that Jess 
I think that's an excellent idea. If if some if strategic planning is on your sort of short term agenda, um, then I think that this would be fantastic. If you if it wasn't just you who knew this, <laughs> because if it's just you who knows this and you walk in, everyone else in the room is still going to be really focused on that one day planning session, and that buy in part for the next is is a lot harder. So I would recommend um, if you do have other people you need to giving it to engage, um, then then you need to have them across why this is important. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, okay, so a question from Felicity. Could you give some quick examples of where you've helped rescues with this, please? Yeah, absolutely. So I've worked with quite a few different rescues on projects big and small. So um, some of the most common ones are those ones around we want to be financially sustainable okay mm -hmm. so organizations that have started with their primary business model is donations okay and we need to come up with ways to overcome that all right and so an example would be starting um in darwin we started puppies training um so rspca darwin we started the puppy training school they were quite a small organization and weren't yet ready for anything bigger but we created as part of their 10-year aspirational goals that they were going to be building dog and cat boarding on site okay so we can create a strategy that is around what's what's immediately possible what can i hire someone to do and make us money in the next six months so that making money is not about um constantly having to kind of go out there and beg we are providing a service for what we get back but we can also create okay now we need to go how are we going to make boarding facilities happen 10 years from now where do we put that in this year's two year strat plan? What do we need to achieve now to lay the foundations for that if that's our 10 year goal? Other examples on an outcome level. So I've worked with RSPCAs locally in WA um, where we really wanted to focus on live release rates and outcomes. So we took their adoptions from, I think it was about 550 a year to just over a thousand a year. So we doubled their adoption rate in less than 12 months um, because those are the things that we focused on. Um, and a lot of that came back to culture that, um, that we decided strategically that the way that one, one of the biggest barriers to adoptions at that particular organization was the, the sort of older school belief that people weren't good enough to adopt their animals. Um, so a huge proportion of that was actually became a culture change strategy. So this is why it's really important to make sure you understand the actual barriers to success before you start putting in plans, you know, oh, well, adoptions will do better marketing when actually people might come into your organization and your staff say, no, you can't have this dog. Um, so it's it's important to make sure that you're you're answering the right, right questions as part of your strategy too. So outcomes, financial sustainability, um, people and culture are the, the biggest things I get asked to help with. Yeah, they're the big ones that affect pretty much everyone. It doesn't matter what size you are, does it? Yeah, and it's not just animal shelters okay. that struggle with this, guys. We're not... You know, like I think almost every shelter I go to, a lot of the staff, not so much the managers, but particularly the staff on the ground always say things to me like, oh, you must be horrified at how far behind we are. Or oh, aren't we terrible at this? Or, you know, how much better are they at that organization? And I can promise you 100% they're all just as far behind as you are okay they might be in different things some of them might have really evolved their technology and some of them might have really focused on their people culture and some of them might be really big and have huge financial reserves but i promise you that place with the great financial reserves has these weird inefficiency double handling still using paper and databases at the same time like I promise you, you are not alone and you are not as far behind as you think you are. It might just be in a slightly different thing to the organization down the road. Yeah, that's very true. We, we find that as well. And, you know, the Jessica and I were talking uh, before we went live about continuous improvement and how that hasn't been a term that's been um, bandied around a lot in our sector, but it's definitely something that... Um, should be on everyone's mind every day so you know once once the strat plan's done or you know even the ops plan um 
things should keep progressing every day. And, and we're, we're in this fantastic place now that in 2021 that we have resources. We, we have all of these online free resources from all around the world. So, um, you know, now's the time. So thank you so much, Jess. Uh, we will let you go. We know you've got to scoot now and go teach a class, but we very much appreciate you being here today. Um, Everybody, if you keep an eye on our social media, sign up for our e-news, you'll be uh, able to keep abreast of what's happening, what next webinars we've got coming up and when you can register. So thank you everybody for your attendance today. Um, feel free to send us through uh, any suggestions for speakers or topics as well. We're really keen to hear what you would like us to cover. We do that for our summits. We get a lot of feedback. Um, you know, in-person events every two years, but um, we can do that here as well. So please let us know. Take care, everyone. Thanks again so much, Jess, and um, have a great day. Bye.